Hi, so welcome everyone. We're back with Research Software Hour after a long summer break. Yeah, welcome back everybody. Yeah. Hi to those watching, hi to those watching the recording later. Mm -hmm. Nice to see Richard again. I mean, we are meeting yeah. often. Meeting <laughs> yeah, almost weekly, I guess, but yeah. yeah. It's really nice to be back. It has been a long break. It has been, well, busy uh, yeah. somehow all this we have been in, a, in an interesting meeting, really mm -hmm. fun meeting last week, but it's nice to restart. I've been looking forward to, to this. Yeah, for sure. So, well, now that we're back, what's our plans for the autumn? So, at least on my side, I'd like to integrate this more into support for my, my main job. So basically make this more relevant to all the computing users at my university somehow and leave it as a sort of like informal way of learning stuff that you wouldn't learn in the academic or non-academic setting. And what about you, Radovan? What's your goals? I think, I mean, generally more streaming and recording. Now for the research software hour, uh, one goal would be also to make it more visible here mm -hmm. in, in Norway, but also to invite more people for uh, interviews and, and I think generally involve more people. So I would yeah. really like that we somehow achieve to involve more questions, more interviews, mm -hmm. more engagement. Yeah. It would be a lot of fun. Yeah. So it's a good question. So what kind of stuff would benefit people? I think, yeah, like more of sort of seeing how normal people work, like maybe not put so much effort into things, but just look at the day-to-day -day life. Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And even like unprepared, if we just show what we do, mm -hmm. or maybe also one thing that we wanted to do since long time, that we do also sessions where we really actually work on something. Mm, that's a good it's, point. It's, it's less, less prepared. Yeah, programming kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. OK. For those joining or under. Uh, in, if you can reach the HackMD, so the collaborative document, uh, that we have a question for you as an icebreaker. We would really love to hear where you are watching from and how the weather is at your place. And you can find it uh, under the video window in, in Twitch. There is a link to, yeah, to the HackMD. Down there. And or also, the I put it in chat or through the website. It's everywhere. Yes, by the way, we have a new. Well, uh, we have redesigned the website. Uh -huh. Should we show it? Quickly? Yeah. Um, do you have it open? Or... Yes. OK, you've got the screen. Right. And here we are. So we have redesigned uh, the, the website source code. Maybe can, we can say something later about the mm -hmm. tech underneath. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the goal was that. It's a bit easier to find also past episodes. Mm -hmm. So today we are we are in episode eight. Uh, the the video archive is easier to find. Um, I have tried to uh, organize better the like topics and what it is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't like Jekyll, you should hear about this new uh, engine Radovan yes. found called yeah. Zola. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So maybe we have time to say something about that. I yeah. really like it a lot. Yeah. So Great. let's see, what's our topics for today then? So today we're talking about parallelizing stuff and, mm, well, and not really parallelizing, like, yeah, like rather than saying command line arguments and then mm -hmm. lightweight, embar embarrassingly parallel kind of stuff. Yes, so, what we will try to do is, yeah. um, in the first, like let's say half of the of the show, we will talk about command line arguments, why we like them, how they can be useful, how to implement them in mm -hmm. in different languages. Maybe we'll show some examples, but then talk about uh, we are often in a situation where we need to run similar tasks. Uh, for instance, we need to run the same script but with 50 different input files or mm -hmm. 500 different input files and 
and there are many ways to do that, but today we will show a couple of ways to, to run these in parallel, but using very simple tools. So this can be done using sophisticated workflows, but today we will not show sophisticated workflows. We will show very simple command line tools to achieve that. Yeah, like the kind of stuff that everyone might need to use for even small things, which I think is as important, if not more important than the other options. And anyway. since before we, uh, before we start, one, thing, one more thing I wanted to mention that we discovered just before the summer, and I wanted to mention, and we, we will put the link here on, on HackMD, our RSE stories, oh. research software engineer stories. This is, this is a podcast um, organized by Peter and Vanessa. They have a weekly, weekly podcast shows. It's a lot of fun, um, really now one of my favorite podcasts to listen to where um, research software engineers are interviewed and um, um, so I think this is really highly recommend to follow. I will put it in the Hackendi. Ah, I just did. Okay, good. Okay. Um, yes. Really super, uh, super initiative. Um, I think it's wonderful that they do it and let's support it. Yeah. So how much preparation does it take for what they do. Is this a very heavy thing or? No, so it's a weekly podcast, but it's alternating. Mm -hmm. So being organized from US and UK okay. every two weeks. Got it. And they are uh, two people. I mm -hmm. think they do it super well. And there is then one, one interview before the recording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, any other initial commentary, or should we get straight to the topics? I think let's oh. let's start with um, let's start with command line parsing. Yeah, and then let's see what comes up. But we would, I mean, the more we deviate from the script, the better. So please ask questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the yeah. or on Twitch chat. Yeah, so with that being said, then when did you first learn about the importance of command line stuff? I guess it can be two parts. When did you learn about command lines in general? And when did you sort of realize that it was an important thing, sort of unique from a graphical way of doing things? So as for me, I used computers when I was young, but I never really I like got the idea. I started with Windows, but I don't know if it was 95 or whatever was before it, but you know, it wasn't really a, well, it wasn't really a deep usage. And it wasn't until I started with Linux sometime in, um, mm, like maybe 20-ish, yeah. no, 15 to 20 years ago mm -hmm. that I actually used it, and then maybe a few more years when I started doing research that I realized this was a really significant thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I discovered them when, for instance, doing a man, visiting man pages, I don't know, man group. Mm. When I wanted to know about some, so these are command line options. Oh, um. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. it took me a while to to know that uh, these these are called flags, mm -hmm. and I didn't know that for a while. So when people talked about you can add this flag or the other flag mm -hmm. to the command, I didn't know what they meant. <laughs> yeah, I, so I don't know why it's called a flag, but sometimes they are called flags, options, flags, options, short options, long options. Mm -hmm. Then for a couple of years, I did not have, I don't even, I didn't even know that I could create these myself. So I was just only using them. But yeah. when did they start to be really useful for, mm -hmm. or how did they start to be really useful in research for you, Richard? Yeah, so I guess when I realized I needed to make my own programs, it was much easier to make them using command line options than to make a graphical program. I mean, like, I didn't even get the idea, like, you know, how to make graphical programs. And even still, I don't, well, 
in theory I know, but it's not something I would actually ever do. But pretty soon I learned that I could make command line scripts and that's really useful. And I think what is really so, great about that is that we can use the same tool, same script, same program on different options, different yeah. inputs, different parameters without without going into the program and changing things because mm -hmm. that's really that's really boring. Like if you yeah. have to do it every time, so it's also error prone. If this is not your own code, then it's nicer that I can have a look at the help text. Mm -hmm. like, uh, like I do now still on screen share here. Yeah. And I can see what, what the tool is expected to do. Mm -hmm. And I don't mm -hmm. have to go in and change things. So it's more, it's also, there is also like reproducibility. Yeah. We can automate things. We can reproduce it because it's easier to rerun mm -hmm. a series of commands than to remember that I had to click here and click there. Yeah. No, I'm sort of still surprised that now, well, maybe not too surprised, but somehow I'm sort of philosophically surprised that these days, whenever I search for a problem, then I'll often be directed to type some stuff in the command line. Mm -hmm. Well, most people I would like, I wonder, so I would imagine that we're sort of the exception for using command line things. But in reality, it seems that most people must be using it because like you search Stack Overflow or whatever for an answer to something. And it is almost always do this from command line, very rarely something else. So are we in some bubble of people that use command line stuff or is it that it's still the way to do things? So I think there is, but there is a difference between using command line tools written by somebody else. And I think many are comfortable with that after a while. Mm -hmm. but also using own tools in a way that is flexible and reproducible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I see, so I see research colleagues sometimes going into the code and having hard coded paths in their, in their scripts, yeah. which don't work on a different hard drive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. I guess you can make the script that you run, but then getting the philosophy of making the script really reusable is yet another sort of abstraction yeah. level on top of that. And we will show yeah. how to approach this in 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 the in the shell and bash. Mm -hmm. We will also hopefully have time to talk about Python. Yeah. Maybe how to design an interface. And then later when I talk about uh, how to parallelize workflows then it becomes incredibly convenient because these mm -hmm. we will see that uh, when once we have a tool that where I can add the options from the outside, then I can often very easily uh, parallelize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So should we get started with bash arguments? Sounds great. Yeah, yes, let's do it. So you want to over the screen or? Yeah, I've got the screen. <laughs> oh. So let's see bash command line arguments. So maybe, well, is it even worth talking about the philosophy of this stuff? Because one of the most fundamental ideas in Unix and I think in Windows too, Mac counting as Unix, of course, is that um, whenever you run a program, it has some, it gets past some parameters which we call the command line parameters. I think you need to increase the, so there is a request to increase the font size uh, on the terminal. I don't know whether this was mm -hmm. my terminal or your terminal, but if you can zoom in a bit. This is, I think I would need to switch to a different terminal to make it bigger. Okay. Um, does this make it any easier to see? I'm not sure. Probably not. The other one was better. So a co like a control plus does not do there. No, because this is X term. It's too old fashioned to work like that. Um, let's see. Um, well, if you like, I can also try to type and you tell me what to type and I will be really clumsy. So <laughs> but I don't know what yeah. to what to show. <laughs> um, Great, well, 
No terminals started the wrong way. Um, okay. Um, hmm. Maybe it's okay. Like I'm watching it on on a different laptop. I'm following the Twitch. And I think it's readable. Mm. So we, will, we will of course try to improve, but maybe we cannot change it right now. But thanks, thanks still for the feedback. Okay, I'm trying one more thing. Yeah, so I think the feedback is that it's good enough. It's good enough. Yeah, it's surprisingly okay. difficult to adjust this via stream if there is a. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, here we are. Um, what did I do? Here I was. So this is a shell. So in basically every programming language, there's some way you can get the array of arguments you pass. So in bash, that is this dollar sign at. So actually there's different ways in bash, but this is um, what I will usually use and good enough to start. So let's see how this works. Um, hmm. How do I make a new pane in Tmux? Uh, oh, I have to find a it was control. Oof. I haven't used it in a few weeks. Probably I, forgotten. Just a sec. I just realized I should do that instead of. Um, so control B, and then how do you want to split it? Like, hmm. how is it vertically? I guess vertically is good. So you do, uh, you do control B, and then percent. N. Control B, mm -hmm. percent. Percent. Aha, okay, there we go. Okay, so here we are. So I run the script with, well, um, it's called CLI0. And, well, it runs. And it doesn't echo anything. So I run this with two arguments and it echoes the two arguments down here. And all these arguments mean basically nothing. So as far as the shell itself knows, it has four different words here that get passed into bash and then bash echoes them out. So if we want them to mean anything, we have to do that ourselves. Um, how do I switch to select the other pane again? Oh, control B and arrow keys. Okay, that's it. Yeah, so what I'll usually do if I want to make a program is then I would say uh, input equals $1. And I'll put this in quotes. So why would I do that? So quotes is important because otherwise there'd be a space here. There could be a space inside of the argument. And we can see what happens for that later. Or actually maybe we won't since it's not so important right now. So here we run. Um, I guess we can make this show input and output. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. So we see input was argument one, output was dash A. So dash A has no particular meaning here. It's just the second thing that's passed. So what's a typical way of designing these interfaces anyway? So any comments, Radovan, well, or? One comment that I can give is that this is relatively simple, but it's often good enough. I don't know, maybe you mm. want to show really about how to do really argument passing, but often yeah, this, that is comes quite, next. this is often quite nice to have just to be able to put in some extra arguments into the script. I wanted yeah. to show one thing that I started doing, because if you know, let's say you leave out an argument because you don't, mm -hmm. You don't know. Do you want your screen? Um, no, 
don't know, you can continue on yours. That okay. yeah. I keep trying to call it, what if you call it only with one? Yeah, and let's the, do that. If the second one will happily continue and say output equals output colon and there is nothing. Mm -hmm. And that can, of course, be problematic if later maybe I move something, remove something. So what mm -hmm. I started doing in these very simple ones to add these safe, some safety flags in bash script. So there is this set EUFO pipe fail mm -hmm. I'll put on top of the script. Uh, it would be so set space dash EUF mm -hmm. uh, space dash O. Yeah. Here I've divided it into two different ones to make sure it's clear that O goes with pipe fail. And I don't remember what they mean. I just I copy paste this from somewhere, but we can try the effect of it. Uh -huh. So this if... fails because it's not bash. So here we go. Uh, yeah. So we've yeah, got so the, error. the main thing is that it will stop at the moment when we try to use a variable which is undefined. And that's mm -hmm. it's a good safety, safety thing. Yeah. So when doing these kinds of things, so the typical convention is that the first argument is the input and second is output. And if output doesn't exist, then it will write to the screen instead. And sometimes if the input doesn't exist, it will read from the standard input. And this is a really well time-tested, time, or what's it called? Battle-tested, time-tested, time-proven. What's the term? Anyway. Yeah, sounds good. Um, form that many programs take. And also what you would, what you should use for other things too. So how about we go to the next higher level of complexity? Actually, how are we doing on time? Let's see. We are 25 oh. minutes in, so. Yeah. I guess we should we go not, a bit faster. Yeah, we will not run out of things. Yeah. So what I would do next is let's say, this is a really primitive way of doing things. And this is what I would always do before. So um, you could do case dollar one in uh, let's see dash a like this, and then isn't it great how bash has for closing of blocks the opposite, they're spelling backwards. So actually, my friends and I once started saying IH for by based on this. That was pretty funny. Yeah, so this is a very primitive way of doing arguments. It's doing everything yourself, but maybe it's educational here. So there's we look at the first argument, and if it's dash a, then we set some variable. And then if so, we shift. So what does shift do? Shift will basically take whatever the arguments are and remove the first one, and then shift all the other numbers down. So let's take a look here. Uh... For educational purposes, I'm removing these so I don't have to deal with missing arguments. So we run it with just one argument, art1. Let's run it with dash a first and see if I did it right. So it ran with dash a and art1, and then it parsed it, and then it shifted it to remove it, and then it has the rest here. So the problem with this is that if you put it in the wrong order, it doesn't work. So really, if you want to do fancy things with argument passing, maybe bash isn't the right thing to do. So by the time you get to this kind of issue, then maybe look into Python that we're going to talk about next. OK, do you want to see the fancy way of doing it with bash. So there's sure. something called git ops. And this is something which I have 
already written in another file here. So this is copied from another program. And it looks somewhat similar. So there's case, argument, different arguments, and then there's some sort of shift here, here. Let's see how it works. So echo argument, here's the argument, and then put the arguments at the end. So let's run this. Um, There we go. Uh, echo bash cli one dot sh with no arguments, and we see there's no arguments. We give it the first argument one one one, second two two two, and now we can give it some other things like dash f. Ah, mm. uh -huh. so. I forgot the dollar sign here. Mm, yeah, there we go. So we see force was set to something here. So it actually did parse it. And the advantage here is we can do things like this. So even though these two were combined together, then it could split them apart and parse them. And this you see here, there's the dash B with a colon after it, that means that B takes an argument. And here we see it's parsed here. So for example, I can do B, let's call it B. And this still worked and the B was still parsed and got removed from the general arguments. But this still has a problem. So for example, if I put dash F at the end, it doesn't get removed, it doesn't get parsed. So there's something that can go a little bit more advanced. This is called git ops with a S on the end, so it's plural. There's something else called git op that's bash specific. Is it dash specific or maybe it's Linux specific, but it can do something a little bit fancier fancier, but it's Linux specific. And here I specifically designed the script so it would work with regular SH even and doesn't require bash or anything Linux specific. So you may look at this and say, this is going a little bit, um, this doesn't look quite readable enough. And you'd basically be right, so. Yeah, same thing here, like when like, for me going in, in bash, for anything going beyond uh, like $1, $1, $2, $3, mm -hmm. it's something that already I can really remember and yeah. I mean, readability is a bit tough. Yeah. And the only reason I even learned it to make this script that you see here was because I wanted it to have no dependencies and work in pure shell and be reasonably good. And other than that, I knew these things existed but never really used it because it just wasn't really worth it. And it was reasonable for the project that you used it for. So this was the Git PR, and I think we, mm -hmm. we showed it a couple of episodes ago. Yeah. And starting there, it was the reasonable choice mm -hmm. to have as few dependencies as possible. Yeah. So that it would be really drop in. Yeah. I mean, but... for anything that goes beyond, personally, I go for mm -hmm. Python. But I mean, any, yeah. any other language also has uh, these, the, the way to pass arguments. Yeah and with, without all the shell quirks. So do you want to share your screen and go into Python parsing? That sounds good. So I will give a yeah. really quick overview of the different options that exist in Python. Mm -hmm. um, You've got the screen. You know, oh yeah, I have the screen. So I prepared something here. And I will. the one thing I want to show on the command line, this will be the, the simplest way and it's and it's equivalent to, to the dollar one, dollar two. Mm -hmm. So the simplest way, but it, it is also a bit brittle. And I will show why 
actually for the same reasons is to to use this sysargv and this would be the this would be the first argument after the script name and this would be the second argument after the script name and we can try it out so it's called example i can try it out example and then my input my output well that's yeah. not very exciting because i should just print it print <laughs> Yeah, same problem I had. Yeah. I would do stuff but not print it. Input this input is input file. And output is output file. Okay, let's try. So that looks pretty nice. Mm -hmm. But the problem is what if uh. I do this? I mean, same problems, but just that it, I think it's good to repeat it. What if I just switch them around? The code has no no way of knowing what I'm... Mm -hmm. So now it's inconsistent. What if I leave one out? Then I get an ugly mm -hmm. error. And, and of course, I could build in some safety measures. I could check how many do I have? What is the length of that ugly? But, but again, for anything that goes beyond the simplest, simplest, simplest script, I like to go for one of the existing libraries, and I will only mention here them. So the traditionally it was opbars, opbars in Python, yeah. but already here warning this is deprecated, <laughs> so I will not even show it. So the the follow the the follow up yeah. is opbars. Yeah. So that's the that's the future of opbars, and this is how it looks when you define it. So you can define uh, here flags, and you can tell what kind of type it is, and you can give it defaults, and you can have a help text. Mm -hmm. And this is much more robust because here, if if I say that this is a this is an option that is required, and I don't provide it, it will give me a nice error message. And when you define your uh, your parser, your interface like this, then then you can call your script with minus h for help or or dash 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 help, and you get this nice help text. So this is maybe the yeah. most standard way in Python. I want to mm -hmm. show two more options, and one is it's an interesting approach. It's doc opt. It's not only for oh. Python, but it's kind of an interesting approach because in, mm. in for doc opt, what you do is you don't you don't describe the options, and it generates for you a help text, like in any other library. Here you, it's mm -hmm. it's the opposite. What you do is you describe you describe the help text, the Make usage the help text, hmm. and from it it will generate a parser. Is this so in the Python standard library? Uh, no, it's not. So the arc parse is, but the doc opt. At least uh, last yeah. time I used it, it was not in the standard library, yeah. so it, you had to, you know, pip install and talk opt. But a nice approach. I use I use it in two two projects. I mm -hmm. want to mention one more, and that is click, click. It's also not in the standard, so this is also something that has to be installed. Mm -hmm. um, this is I I like this one. Here you define your command line options as a decorator. You can define them close to where they are used. The, the, the use mm -hmm. case where Click really shines is when you need to compose different tools which mm -hmm. each of mm -hmm. command arguments. So it is yeah. designed for them to be modular and composable and so you, nested. So you don't have to pass the raw options from one function exactly. to another function to another, something like that. Exactly. So imagine that we have a tool which has command line arguments, mm -hmm. and we have a tool which also has one, but now we want to combine them. And then yeah. now we don't know like who will parse the options and mm -hmm. how the channel to the other one. Yeah. And this, this is really designed with this with this problem in mind. I like to use it. I admit that I never had that problem, but uh, I like to use it because I like to use other tools from mm -hmm. the same from the same well ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that's why. I, across it but i mean all of them are fine 
So with click, if you, um, I guess that means, actually, so with click, if you ask for a help text, can it know of all the options for all of the different functions that are in there? I guess if it's, if yes. the functions are written at the main level of the program in a module that is actually imported, then it can know. Yes. There's also okay. this, which I'm not exactly sure what that means. So it means that... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've used yeah. it with, for very like simple yeah. examples. And, and I know... That... Yeah, this is how it looks when you get the help text. I noticed that um, click is in the default Anaconda install, which is kind of nice. Oh, okay. So, also we have a note in HackMD about something called Fire. I'm going to take a look at that really quick. Let's do fire it. on any Python object. Uh, yeah, so there are many. Huh. So I see. So it looks like you, it infers what the arguments are from the arguments of the function and translates them to command line arguments. Uh, so this is similar. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a similar approach like click. So instead of adding a decorator, we, we wrap the function call into mm -hmm. comes from fire. Yeah, very nice. interesting. Is this very heavily used? Do you know? Whoever proposed this to us? Yeah. That's all I wanted to show in terms of Python. I yeah. don't know whether we have time to talk about design of an interface or whether we should go into parallelization. Hmm. I think it would be good to talk at least a little bit. So, what I've noticed as pretty standard is that you have a program um, the first I guess some terminology some people will say argument means something without dashes and option is something with dashes but I guess it's sort of whatever you want um, want to call it so options can be required or optional. The usually the early or the most important ones go first. So that way, if you leave off the later ones, the first ones are still parsed correctly without ambiguity. There's usually a first argument for input and optionally a second argument for output. Um, and also make the make the common tasks easy. So the common things should be without a lot of typing. Mm -hmm. Maybe the less common things should be possible. Yeah. I guess one strategy people will use is to have a long option that never changes. And if you're writing a script or something that should always work in the future, then you would use that. And the short options, well, if the letters change or something, then that's, well, it's never good to change something that's in use, but it's less bad than changing the long names. At least a little bit. Are you thinking about backwards compatibility, basically? So if you change something in the future, will all of your other code suddenly get messed up? Because that's never a good situation. Hmm. Mm, yeah. Have you ever written a program that requires options? So I have sometimes, I do it very rarely, but when there would be enough arguments that would get confusing to list them all without any decoration. So then I say, okay, a dash dash name option is required or something like that. Like these days I almost always do it. Mm -hmm. And simply, I will forget how it worked, and then uh, um, it's easier to use. Yeah. I will almost always go for having options also. Yeah. I mean, having flags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. Sometimes when it gets a bit too like too too many input arguments or too many input data, then then I I read them from a file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then the then the input file name can be uh, option to the to the script. Yeah. Okay. Well, should we go on to whatever's next? So, just checking whether anything any question came up or remark. Otherwise, we can talk about mm. yeah. So, so one thing I wanted to show, if we have time, is that a very simple. Uh, we will run a script on an input file, and we create we will create an output file. Mm -hmm. but, but I will have ten of these, and I will use. I will. I want to show a couple of strategies how we can do that in parallel really simply yeah so okay should i take you, over the screen yes you have the screen yes okay. so the thing that i will i want to show is all here on the github under resource software or so i will take this repository so later you can find it if i go too fast and maybe maybe we should can link it yeah yeah so let me clone that to my computer i will do the same And I will explain what is inside there. Inside there, I have a couple of uh, couple of input files, and these are JPEGs. So these are pictures. Let's have a look. And they are all the same because, but but the computer doesn't know that they are the same. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and what is in there? Yeah. This is a picture I found <laughs> on Wikipedia searching for automation. So this is how bread is made with these robots. So it's really sad. I was always imagining that there is some, you know, manually artisanal yeah. bread, but instead it's these <laughs> three robots that move things from A to B. And and I think it's also fun. Uh, like I think for bread, I, I prefer the the manual artisanal work, but for <laughs> for um, input files, there is a there is a case for automation. So here we see three processors and mm -hmm. in, in the computer that I'm presenting from I have four and I will try to use all four of these and we will move okay we will do something from A to B. So let's see and let's imagine that we do something researchy. So instead of a JPEG, well maybe it's a JPEG but so the thing I want to do and just that I I need to do one more thing and that is I will create a result directory. And I will, I will use image magic to convert the images to something else. Mm -hmm. Here, I want to limit image magic to not run in parallel itself, because otherwise, so I can imagine that what I wanted to have is that we have a script that is sequential. So here, I'm preventing the tool that I want to show to run in parallel itself, because I want to parallelize myself. All right. And the thing I wanted to show is image magic super useful. Uh, you can convert formats. I want to use this paint option, which is really fun. So this is my input file. This is my output file. And here I run it manually. But later I want to process all ten of these mm -hmm. in, a, in a more clever way. And I want to show yep. you the result. Is it fun? So you can create these like oil paintings. You can, you can maybe increase the the paint. You can make more rough, nicer looking result. Oh yeah, so that looks whoa. Yeah, and I want to do this operation on all all ten of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what is my first approach? My first approach will be. Oh uh, well, I could just execute this line one after another. It's really boring and it's not parallel because I would like to use the four processes that are in this computer. So what the next thing I can try to do, and I have uh, I have prepared that here, is to use a make file. To use make. Uh, and this is something that I have really used once many years ago. I needed to prepare, I needed to process many, many input files. 
and I was getting desperate, time was running out. Mm -hmm. I didn't have enough time to run them one after another. And what I did was something similar to here. And this connects to Richard has talked about make in spring. Yes. And but I want to explain quickly what is going on here. What I'm what I'm telling make here is <laughs> this is the classic make, I guess. So how many weird symbols do we see? But it's not supposed to be called that, it's supposed to be called JPEG. Um I want to create these result JPEGs out of my JPEGs. I tell make how to do that. And these symbols I, I didn't I forgot, but this one is the the input and this is the output. And I tell make to do that on all of them. So I was looking at this, just think this has a dollar sign, parentheses, percent sign, less than an at sign. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of symbols yep. for something so short. I cannot remember that. I'm always reusing some old make file that I have. But we are, I am describing a rule on how to process these files. What is really nice now about make is that I can, I can well run it and it will process them one after another and it will take, it's, it's a bit slow. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I will, I don't have a make clean, so I want to re remove the results. But the really nice thing I can do is I can say, well, use four processors and make does it. Because it knows that these are independent steps and already this took a lot less time. The, any comments on that? Looks good. I mean, yeah. I guess the main point here is that by defining the tasks and not what to do, then make or whatever it is can go and run this all for you and yeah. order it however it fits. So this was solution one using make file. Solution two would be using a shell loop. This is not parallel. This is looping over all the images and converting them one after another. Mm -hmm. But I want to show you a nicer way, which is this one. And I will explain what's going on. This is a really nice way. So let me copy paste it into here. Uh, call it one sh. I should have also the tmax, but. So I will, I will explain. I make it executable. Maybe let me comment out a few things here first. Um, this was my original solution, but I added this ampersand here at the end. And the ampersand means continue, don't wait. Don't mm -hmm. wait until you just mm -hmm. do the next one. Yeah. I, I could use the script like that. I could use it like this, but it would, well, it would run in parallel, but it would run a little bit too much in parallel because it would, it would start all the processes, all the, all the, all the 10 jobs, it would start them up. And maybe if I start too many, I would, mm -hmm. I don't know, I would, the laptop would, would give up. So this right. is not exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. So, and I got to say that to make it a bit more difficult, I created 10 input files. And I have four processors because I didn't want it to be too easy and divisible. Mm -hmm. But let me now explain what's going on here. So I have a counter, and on uh... each in, in the shell, uh, in each loop, I increase it. Okay. And if the counter is divisible by four, so that's a the cryptic way of saying if it's mm -hmm. divisible by four, then wait. And this wait command will wait here until all the child processes that I have started until, until they are finished. Every task finishes. Yeah. And mm. then I add another one. And why was that? Because I have yeah. here 10 files and I have four processors. 
So I also here want to wait until the two are finished before I continue with my script. Huh. Let's let's try. I've never done this before. This is very really nice. Um, wait like oh, this. Can work on a on a cluster. Yeah. So let, let's see, and we will see that. Blah, that didn't work. <laughs> Why? Hmm. What was the message marked as an executable? <laughs> Does it need the oh, shebang yeah. at the top? Yeah, it doesn't know what to do with it. Although yes. whenever I've run executable files that didn't have that, it would just run it with the default interpreter as yeah. the shell. But, uh, the reason is because I'm on a fish shell, which is, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't do it. It's, it's smarter. And how was that bash? That was just missing. Yeah. And now? Suspense, will it work? We see that they transform oh. at a batch. It's a bit quick. Wow. Maybe should... Let me make it huh. slow. We'll make it slower by making a bit more rough oil painting. Oh. I could see four, it. Four at a time, mm. four at a time, and then it will run the two last ones. Yeah. So that's really, I think that's really cool. So I want, we have time, a little bit more time. I want to show two more ways of doing mm -hmm. it. And also, while you were doing this, I prepared it with an array job on our cluster. So oh, great. I can, so we can, you can also show, show it. that. And mm -hmm. we, will, we have enough time because I think I need five more minutes and I'm done on my side here. Yeah, that's plenty. I will first show this one. I will explain what it uh, was. So Upstate Cyclist on chat said, we're making your own queuing system for in the for loop. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing, but also it's not the kind of thing that we look really, or we don't look, we don't like the people to do that on our cluster because then you get things like people running hundreds of processors on the front end node with their own queuing system and, yeah, you know. The other interesting use case can be, and I shouldn't say it because I'm, I'm also a part-time high-performance <laughs> computer, is that you can use it if you, if the the cluster tells you you should only run jobs on mm -hmm. four nodes, yeah, but your job doesn't scale to four nodes, and then you can use this to package them up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, not to recommend it. <laughs> to yeah. do. Well, at least in that case, you're reserving your own resources. <laughs> yes. Which, yeah. yeah. So I want to show this way. I will explain a bit what is going on. Um, I'm using the find command. I I tell the find command, please find me all the files that end with JPEG. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But don't go into results. That's why this max steps stay in this repository. Uh, stay in this uh, directory. Mm -hmm. I think at some point we should talk about find. Super useful if you want to do mm -hmm. something on many many files. I don't know. You want to find all the files that are bigger than a certain size or older mm -hmm. than a certain date. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. Maybe I should try. Let's try this one first. So someone asked why the complicated find command. I guess that's because it can fit into all the subdirectories and so on. But yeah, what you proposed, the ls, like an ls with a glob would work just as well here. Yes, that's right. But yeah, why do you we'll find? Find is indeed a little, can be a little bit involved, but what is nice about find, and I already lost it, is that I can, I can, no, I copied a bit too much. There is a, so you can look for things, files, which is a certain attribute. Mm -hmm. I can pipe it into Xargs. Mm -hmm. Xargs is incredibly useful because Xargs is, allows me to then apply something on every file I find, do something with it. Uh, yeah. And I recommend the first thing you do with it is echo because you want to check that your command. <laughs> is yeah. And what this does is that. But should echo be common? after dash capital I? Or. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Right, 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 right. Because. So that's before. what I like to do to just check that. I want to see what it's what is mm -hmm. expected to do, and we will see that it, it will replace all 
it will put all the JPEGs into these underscores. Let's see. Mm -hmm. So that looks mm -hmm. pretty good. Yeah. But now I only echoed it. And now I actually convert. Mm -hmm. And it takes a few seconds. But what I wanted to show this XRX has this flag mm -hmm. parallel four, which I discovered only a couple of months ago. And you can really run them. Mm -hmm. You can instruct. Well, let's let's make it more difficult here. You can instruct or uh, XRX to use the processors. Right. So that was the second last option. That was and quite the, fast. And the the very last option is again I'm using find, but instead of using XRX, you can use hmm. power. And it, it works. So this has a similar effect like this one. Mm -hmm. I think I don't need to show it. I think the one I don't think I want to show is that it has a really interesting way of enforcing citations. Mm. And I, I think we, it, this will resonate to all of us. Citations, citation notice. Huh. Yeah, fun, I just wanted to quote this one here. Funding free software is hard. The less visible a project is, the harder it is to get funding. Mm -hmm. The nature of this tool is that it will never be seen by the guy with the checkbook. Yeah, I mean, we uh, we often have that problem. You know, could, could you even say that the more important something is, it gets used everywhere and then it becomes invisible because it's everywhere, so you just assume? Yes there <laughs> okay. yeah, so this was i i talked a lot here that was we will share the maybe or the idea can be so we have these different i think i already lost the link yeah we have these different ways mm -hmm. i'm sure there are more if you know more ways but, it'd be fun to hear and richard will show one more yeah right? but what was yeah. in the citation notice there did it say how to cite it or yeah what did it that, what so was the end oh, Limit and you should use this parallel dash dash citation to work for me. Yeah, I just tried to run it and it gave an error. So I think that's outdated. So you can like make this somehow go away by calling dash dash citation, but but it didn't work for me. Huh. But I think it's quite interesting. So what anyway, does the so notice say when it like did it say please cite this program if you use it for a paper yeah. or something like that. I've never. I think something changed in the in the meantime. Yeah. Huh. Anyway, the link okay. is there. Interesting. Thanks to thanks to Ashwin for showing me this tool. Yeah. And I think I give back the screen to to Richard, who has one yeah. more way, and then we are yes. Already. And then we're close to the end of time. Well, the end of our time. So here yeah. I am on our cluster, and. I cloned the files and wanted to do this with array jobs. So an array job basically says you have one script and it runs with lots of different data. And this is a Slurm cluster. Slurm is the workload manager and batch queuing system. So in Slurm, there is one variable called, I hope I get this right, Is it array task ID or something else? Let's look. Hmm. Job array. So I know what I'm looking for. Yes, Slurm array task ID. Slurm array task ID, but spelled wrong. That would be a fun mistake. So first what I'm going to do is take this. So when the script runs, this will be set to the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in different invocations of the script. So I'm setting i to this number. And then I'm using this uh, printf command, which should make id be the Two letter, or it should pad it with the zero in front. Actually, I'll make this faster like this. 
and then let's echo it. Um, and then I'm going to hear and run the conversion. So ID. So here I had to map the input array index to the file names. And there's many different ways of doing this. Um, here I did it sort of directly and explicitly. So now when I submit this, um, actually before I submit it, we should specify what it will need. So it will take, um, it takes one minute which is too short to, or so short we shouldn't be running it on our cluster, but this is a demo, so it's okay. How much memory do I need? I guess. Oh, yeah, the admin. <laughs> and there are like two admins watching, right? Or yeah, at least. <laughs> but as we say, anything is fine if you're doing it small and testing it. Okay, so here we are. Oh. And what about the output? So, mm, so I'm going to direct all the outputs to the same file for simplicity. Um, Okay, so are there any problems here? Is it going to work the first time? I mean, almost certainly it's not going to work, but that's sort of the way life goes. Let's submit it. Uh, sbatch slurm array.sh, and here's the important part. Array from 1 to 10. Actually, I sort of wonder what if image magic isn't installed on the nodes? Okay, append is not recognized. So let's look it up in the manual, man as batch. And I search for append in here using slash in less. Okay, open mode equals append. Now do you think it will work? Think it will work? I have no idea. So it's pending. A bunch of stuff is running. It's all done running. Oh, and there's a bunch of results there. Uh, let's look at the output. Mm, why is array.out a binary file? Let's look at it anyway. I wonder where that came from. Are those null bytes in there? Yeah, weird. Huh. Okay, well anyway, so it says done with two, done with one, three, the order was undetermined, mm -hmm. with a one, three. Maybe there were, actually I guess since these were all running on different nodes at the same time, maybe there were race conditions in the output. So that has corrupted the contents of the file. Okay, so maybe, appending and an array job is not such a great idea. Okay. Uh, do you want to look at them? Can we? Yeah. Um, so this is now on a distant cluster? Yes. Okay. Uh, but I've mounted it with SSHFS here. Triton. Uh, it will take some time to read all the data through. 
I hope this doesn't start on a different display. Hmm. Well, in the meantime, I can say that I see only HackMD that there is another Python solution for running. Mm. Um, Multiprocessing so pool. Tasks yeah. in parallel through a, a multiprocessing tool pool. This is something we have been we are right now uh, teaching a Python course. So we have been discussing this yesterday. So this is a nice solution. Thanks for submitting this. Also a way to parallelize wow. sequential jobs. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so that's it. That's an array job. Actually, it was a lot less work than I expected it to be. Or maybe I should say it was less, there were less bugs than I expected. Um, <laughs> Just but, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a comment here that um, putting sbatch, you can put the array command inside of the batch script. Yeah. So yes, you can do that. In this case, I sort of wanted to separate the runs from what was hard coded in there. So if I could select, I'll always select that at runtime, but yeah, really, well, it's up to you. So um, what time is it? Yeah, I think we are over time already. So maybe we talk about static side generators some other time. Mm -hmm. Um, but hopefully we managed to give an overview of a couple of uh, couple of ways to speed things up and automate. Yeah. So, what do y'all think? Was this a useful thing to talk about? Did you learn anything? And what should we talk about later? Yeah, we would really love to get suggestions for next next week. Yeah. And how do you think we can attract more of the people we work with to watch this, if this is useful? Yeah, well, I mean, the time is ideal or not ideal, but it will never be ideal for everybody. Yeah. We have the great recordings also. Uh, yes, there will be, well, this HackMD will be available and the recording will be on YouTube within an hour or two, so. Yeah. I can show maybe where we put these things later. Uh, if you give me quickly the screen share. Yes. Uh, you've got it. Yeah. So on the website, uh, I will very, very soon put another entry here, RSH8. And then if you click on these, uh, then we put in uh, the, the discussions and the, the links and the questions and the answers. I will, I will attach them here. Is the video linked here? The videos are linked up here, okay. the, all the playlist. Okay. What we yeah. could do is we could link the individual videos to individual pages, so there's yeah. something we can do. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, maybe we shouldn't drag this on too long tonight. Yeah. Thanks it's everybody for, long enough. for watching. Yeah. So I guess what I can ask everyone, or probably Radovan's the same. So talk to your colleagues and coworkers and decide what is it that they need in order to do their work better. And let us know and we'll produce content for them and to address these kinds of things. And I think maybe like even if it's a uh, watch non-interactively as a video later, that's still a really useful way of doing things. So yeah, let us know. It would be funny, what if we made watching these streams a requirement of requirements of using our clusters? Wouldn't that be funny? I mean, it would never work, but it's a clever idea. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Thanks so, for shot. As for how often we do these streams, we do them, well, we try to do them once a week. And that's what we did in the spring. And then we had a long break and now we've got um, it resuming, hopefully every week.
it really depends on how many people show up and how many ideas we get for what to cover. So send us ideas. So it's traditional that now we have some time and we'll answer any question that you might throw at us if you have any. But if there's none, then we can just go right away. See anything in the hash ID? So the hash ID. Uh, yeah, we have used the word parsing, and that really explained what that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but otherwise, I think everything is more or less answered. The one feedback on via Twitch is to do to also cater to, to different levels. Novices, more expert stuff that we mix it up a bit. Mm -hmm. Can you do some CDO and CO tutorial? I don't know what it is. What does that mean? Oh, machine learning tutorial. So I don't know the acronyms NCO, CDO. Yeah. yeah. I'm searching, but I can't find what yeah. it might be. Okay, um, there's a question, what version of Bash are we running? So this is, let's see, on mine. Mine is 4.2.46 and Radovan was 5.0.18. So while there is the git opt instead of git ops, that's a little bit more advanced, but still for me, the point of bash scripting is that it works everywhere. And um, yeah, like many of these end up being released as external utilities. So that's a bit hard to, um, like hard to assume that people have and can install or whatever. So yeah. Okay, well, we've got some good ideas here. Um, okay. So apparently, uh, CDO is climate data operators. If I found, if I search the right thing, hmm. yeah, I need to read up on that. Yeah. But anyway, maybe we should stop the recording and. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder if Anne would have some comments on this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's turn off for the night. Thanks to everyone for watching and see you next week, same time. Yeah, looking forward. Thanks. Okay, great. Bye. Bye.